Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this dark and rainy night. I'm very pleased as co-chair of the Wayne Morse Center for Law and Politics Advisory Board and as dean of the law school to welcome you to this, uh, one of our Wayne Morse Center Distinguished speaky, Speaker Series events. I'm Margie Paris, and I'm delighted to have you here this evening. Um, this evening we'll feature a, a wonderful speaker whom our president, Dave Fronmeyer, will introduce you to in a moment. Following uh, Mr. Tipton's remarks, we'll have a book signing and a reception in our Morse Commons, the, the big area as you go outside these doors. As you know, or as you may know, our theme for this year's Wayne Morse Center for Law and Politics exploration, um, and for next year as well, is democracy and citizenship in the 21st century. Surely one of the most contested arenas is the role of religion in public life. And tonight we're privileged to hear from one of America's foremost religious scholars who will discuss the issue of religion in public life. Before we get to our main event, however, I have a few thank yous. I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of this uh, event, the UO Humanities Center, the Robert D. Clark Honors College, and the Departments of Philosophy, Religious Studies, and sociology. And I'd like to deliver a special thanks to Sam Porter, a community member of the Wayne Moore Center Advisory Board, who has been tireless in organizing this visit and whose friendship and studies with Professor Tipton has, been, uh, a major, has played a major role in our bringing Professor Tipton here. Um, a few announcements about upcoming events because I can't resist the opportunity to, to put in a few plugs. Um, outside, by the way, the Wayne Morse Center has a table and you'll find some brochures about these upcoming events. This year, Arturo Escobar will be the occupant of the Wayne Morse Center uh, Chair of Law and Politics. And he will be here during the first part of winter quarter, so right after the uh, beginning of the year. He'll teach an anthropology class. He'll participate in a major conference on democracy and human rights in Latin America. And on January 31st of 2008, you can all plan to be here for a public address focusing on the current political developments in Latin America. A few other upcoming events. We're, we will have a symposium on, on immigration and citizenship um, organized by the law school's own Garrett Epps, who is also the Morse resident scholar this year. Professor Epps has invited a number of scholars and advocates to debate immigration policy. That event will take place again here on January 25th, uh, a Friday. And then finally, please know that after um, Dr. Tipton's remarks, we'll have a book signing and a reception out in the commons. Please join us. Professor Tipton's book, Public Pulpits, we had hoped to get uh, ready for book signing for you tonight, but um, Professor Tipton informs us that it hasn't yet been released from the press. It's in groups uh, two months late. It's all the University of Chicago fault. Oh, good. We get to blame a sister institution. Um, but we do have here for uh, your purchase, if you'd like, and, and perhaps uh, an autograph, uh, the new edition of Habits of the Heart, Individualism and Commitment in American Life. Many of you, I think, have, have read earlier editions of Habits of the Heart. It was one of the most influential books of the 1980s. And this new edition has just been released, and it contains an introduction that relates the arguments of the book to current realities and the debate over our country's future. So without further ado, I am going to um, introduce our wonderful president, Dave Fronmeyer, who will introduce our speaker, President Fronmeyer. Thank you very much, Dean Paris. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for coming tonight to this really uh, thrilling evening of content and conviviality. It's not often, in fact, that we have the opportunity to hear a former murder investigator and semi-pro baseball player speak on the topic of religion, democracy, and public life. So perhaps a more savvy PR title of this evening would have been CSI, RBIs, and the Meaning of Life. <laughs> but we are not in sweeps week here uh, at the University of Oregon, so we're honored instead to have with us this evening a scholar whose work, in fact, and research bring us insight into issues that have long been at the heart of our national experience. A simple internet search of the words religion in America yields 108 million hits. From the founder, uh, founders of our nation today 
uh, political pundits, faith, politics have always intertwined in our national political life. And whether one approaches it from the standpoint of believers or non-believers, skeptics or enthusiasts, conservatives or liberals, traditionalists, revolutionaries, religion and the questions it asks as well as the answers that it provides or fails to offer is part of our political DNA, a vital thread that at times drives our actions and sometimes drives us quite mad. In many ways, religion is the search for that which can never be totally understood. Politics, on the other hand, is supposed to be a struggle for that which can be done. Together, that yearning for the unknowable and for the workable creates an energy that can build or destroy. In America, as in the rest of the world, history has shown us the benefits and tragedies of this volatile but oh-so-human pairing. And one doesn't have to look very far. Stay within the borders of Oregon. Matthew Deedy, the founder of the Oregon Constitutional Convention, the first chair of the Board of Regents of the University of Oregon, chaired the Constitutional Convention with an overt dislike of Methodists. And the Constitution of Oregon reflects a specific allegiance to religious neutrality that's quite contrary to that contained in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. In the early 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan controlled the Oregon legislature and helped to elect its governor. And from that body came a body of laws challenged in Pierce versus Society of Sisters because the Klan in Oregon's case was not uh, overtly racist, there weren't enough people here to be racist about in that sense, but it was overtly anti-Catholic, and that too helped to shape our state experience quite literally to this day, including laws that still are on the books. More recently, and in my own time, Rajneesh Karam was founded, the first genuine theocracy probably documented by and ruled upon by a federal court in the history of the United States or more recently and equally, maybe more controversial, uh, Employment Division versus Smith, the so-called peyote case, uh, decided in this state, uh, but decided ultimately by the United States Supreme Court, changing the very meaning of the religion clauses of the United States Constitution. And more recently, elections fought over gay and lesbian rights in this state and laws pertaining to that. And more recently, and frankly, even touching my own life, the national debate on stem cell research and its life-saving potential for young children uh, and the capacity of religion and politics to change the course of scientific research. That's all here. It's nothing that has to do with a worldwide landscape. So in that landscape, it's a pleasure now to introduce us all to Stephen M. Tipton, whose work and words help to shed valuable light on religion, faith, and the national experience. He teaches sociology, religion, and ethics at Emory University and is its Candler School of Theology professor of sociology of religion. He's a graduate of Harvard University with a joint PhD in sociology and the study of religion. He's the author of Public Pulpits, a study of national religious advocacy by mainline churches in Washington, D.C. It's forthcoming, as we have heard, painfully still forthcoming, but soon to appear. Uh, and Getting Saved from the 60s, Moral Meaning and Conversion and Cultural Change. He co-authored, as you know, with Robert Bella and other authors, Habits of the Heart, nominated then for a Pulitzer Prize and now in its second edition. And to return to my first sentence, this native of San Francisco has in fact worked earlier in Harlem as a murder investigator for the uh, New York State Superior Court and he played semi-professional baseball in California. With that variety of experiences and that excellence, please join me in helping to welcome to this University of Oregon uh, platform, Stephen Tipton. Stephen. Thank you, President Frommeyer uh, and Dean Paris. And uh, Mr. President, that's an uh, eloquent and uh, apt introduction. I'm referring all the legal questions to you. Um, uh, and let me thank all of you uh, for joining us here tonight in honor of Wayne Morse. He served the people and his conscience without compromise. He could not be bullied 
into silence or bribed into double talk. May we work and vote for those who do likewise. Let me ask you, what is the role of religion in American public life? Let's think about it for a moment. Is it prophetic witness, voice of conscience, social activist and reformer, moral advocate and interlocutor? Or is it Good Samaritan, helping hand, loving heart and saving grace, community volunteer and charitable donor? Maybe it's all of the above, one of those trick kind of academic questions. Or maybe it should be none of the above, at least not in public. Can we draw a bright line to keep churches out of political parties and election campaigns as well as the corridors of government power? Does that mean we should let no claims of divine revelation, however tightly wrapped in the flag of one nation under God, restrict reason? in pursuit of liberty and justice for all. Recurring efforts to ask and answer the question of religion's public place and role reach back to the beginning of American society, and they run all the way through our history. Not just the history of the ideas, but the history of our actions, of our social movements and institutions. And, and, they have multiplied and grown more divisive in recent decades. As religious differences have resurged in our electoral and party politics, and as religious institutions have grown more politicized in themselves. What stymies univocal efforts to answer this question in the United States today is not simply the conflicting play of political interests and ideologies. For example, between godly values voters against abortion and same sex marriage, and prophetic progressives who call us to withdraw from Iraq fight poverty at home, and check global warming worldwide. It is also an argument between contrasting ideals, faith in public, and the good of government within the polity of a democratic republic, that is, the public square of a free, self-governing society. This contest of moral meaning and practice unfolds within the peculiar yet essential ambiguity of the American polity both as a cultural constellation of moral traditions and as a social order of institutionally arranged relationships and practical activities. This ambiguity, in turn, frames the contest by focal flow and logic of argument. Given this premise, we can begin to grasp, if not resolve, the paradox of religion's place in our public life and at least a little bit of its constitutional expression. So let me talk at the start about freedom of religion. Let me suggest that it means more than one thing in America. Why is that? Because it's construed within the context of more than one moral tradition in our culture. This becomes clear if we distinguish the meaning of freedom within the context of what I'll grossly oversimplify as the biblical and civic or Uh, kind of humanistic, republican, small r republican traditions in our culture, we can distinguish those meanings from the more instrumental and expressive traditions of our individualism. So I want to talk about four mm, construals, cultural construals of the meaning of freedom. Very broad. And then I'll kind of step forward a little bit and talk about religious freedom in particular. Freedom in the biblical sense means freedom from sin, especially the selfish bias of original sin, which delimits love to one's own kind, whether that's kin, class, race, or nation. It means freedom to do God's will and love all of God's children, accepting responsibility for them and to them. I'm my brother's keeper and my sister's, and less comfortably, they are mine. True moral freedom to do that only which is good, just, and honest, in the words of John Winthrop, the pilgrim's first governor, is defined by reference to a biblical covenant between humankind and God. It consists of mutual duties and virtues based on divine commandment, first of all, to love God, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. It's a covenant, too, to seek God. To this end, it makes of life a pilgrimage, not a free pass to go wherever you want, but a journey like that of the people of Israel 
to the promised land. Freedom in the classical Republican sense, with a small r, means freedom from ignorance and the biased understanding that chains each person in solitary shadows, as Plato puts it in the myth of the cave. The truth shall make us free to live together in accord with the lawful moral order that informs nature and illuminates human wisdom. Thus, the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle a people to be independent, as Jefferson writes in the opening paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, and all persons are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So freedom of religion, speech, and opinion, conceived as elements of the natural rights of humankind, aim at ensuring that true believers, including Bible believers, cannot impose their views on others through arbitrary state action and censorship, and thereby foreclose the enlightening moral argument of public life. Freedom depends in practice on an educated society of political equals who responsibly take part in this argument at the center of Republican self-government. Uh, three on the list. In its more instrumental or kind of means ends, utilitarian sense, by contrast, freedom means the individual's freedom from restraint, exerted by another individual's will or by undemocratic social authority or hierarchy. Thus Ben Franklin praised economic and occupational equality in defense of democracy in the Pennsylvania colony where he said, farmers, artisans, and tradesmen are pretty much upon a level. They enjoy and are fond of freedom, and the meanest among them thinks he has a right to civility from the greatest. So individual rights and due process of law reflect the nature of essentially self-defining, yes, and self-interested individuals and their social equality, rather than the dictates of nature's God or God's covenant. Expressive freedom is similarly the individual's freedom to express oneself against the constraints of social convention and others' expectations. It's the freedom to feel strongly and deeply, to be open to all kinds of experience, to explore the cosmic and social identities that make the self the very source of all existence. And not least, it's the bohemian freedom to shrug off Franklin's bourgeois maxim that time is money, and instead of always working, worrying, and reinvesting for the future, to spend time freely, to be here now, to lean back and loaf and invite my soul, as Walt Whitman writes in his song of myself. Now, let's get a little closer to kind of the legal, civic uh, uh, case in point. These distinctive forms of traditional cultural construal, and in some ways lived out moral intuition, accord with what we might more simply term civic freedom in the positive sense of our freedom as a people to govern ourselves together, and liberal freedom, philosophical liberal, not liberal political versus liberal conservative. Uh, most of the philosophical liberals are in some ways mm, politically conservative uh, insofar as they focus on individual interest, free market solutions, and so on. Liberal freedom in the negative sense of our freedom as individuals from other interference. Now note how this distinction underlies bifocal construal of religious freedom as the Constitution defines it. The First Amendment states Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Seen from the traditional standpoint of civic freedom, the free exercise of religion is the controlling ideal which non-establishment serves. The establishment of any particular confessional faith or church is prohibited because it would infringe on the free exercise and positive institutionalization of religion generally in what was already 200 years ago a confessionally diverse nation. Such infringement wouldn't simply coerce some citizens to support a confession not their own. It would exclude these citizens from full political membership and public participation based on religious difference. Disestablishing and deconfessionalizing religion in public doesn't simply protect churches from state interference and the state from wars of religion. It enables all citizens to conceive the common purposes of their lives together in relation to, quote, God's purposes in nature's laws, as the Declaration says. In this universal light, it allows them to judge these common purposes, to argue over them coherently, and to live them out more or less persuasively, Persuade by exemplification, not just by argument or giving good reasons. 
Thus, religion lies at the moral center of public life, even as the institutional bodies of church and state remain distinct, each governed by its own members. Now, let's turn it around. If the free exercise of religion is conceived primarily in terms of liberal freedom, by contrast, the moral logic of the two clauses is inverted. Disestablishment controls the free exercise of religion and subsumes it into the concept of the separation of church and state. Religious freedom then comes to be construed as the individual's right to worship any god you please or none at all, and religion becomes a private matter of no inherent concern to political society. Disestablishment and deconfessionalization imply privatization, and mm, by conflation with principles of religious toleration, they justify efforts to bracket religion outside of public life. Now, these twofold terms of constitutional interpretation reflect a fundamental American ambiguity. Are we a republic in recognizable relationship to classical or early modern, especially for us, Calvinist republics, and dependent for our integrity upon a sense of civic virtue and the mores of republican citizenship? Or are we a liberal constitutional regime governed through the coordination of individuals' conflicting interests and equal rights? The American answer, in sum, is that we have sought to be both, to enjoy civic and liberal freedoms alike to retain the moral integrity and binding public spirit of a republic in the political structure of a liberal constitutional democracy with its stress on voluntarism and personal sovereignty. In so doing, we've lived with profound tensions. Overriding concern for self-interest is a very definition of the corruption of republican virtue, which must check free choice even as it guides free conscience through a sense of mutual responsibility and duty. Yet from the beginning, America has been both a religiously resonant, not completely rooted or derived, but a resonant uh, republic that depends on the participation of public-spirited citizens for its shared self-government, and a liberal constitutional democracy that pledges to protect the individual rights of self-interested citizens who pursue wealth, but also knowledge too, through free markets for economic and intellectual exchange. The liberal tradition of public philosophy in America conceives persons, first of all, as independent selves. Unencumbered by moral or civic ties, they themselves have not chosen. Freedom consists in the very capacity of such persons to choose their own values and their own ends. Fair procedures then take priority over particular moral ends, particularly when they're posed as public goods. Individual rights function is kind of like moral trump cards played to ensure the state's neutrality among competing conceptions of the good life. By contrast, the civic republican tradition conceives freedom as the fruit of sharing in self-government with our fellow citizens whose public spirited character is cultivated by these very practices of deliberating together over goods diverse enough to be pursued in common and sharing responsibility for the destiny of the political community. Now let's keep this underlying ambiguity in mind and think a little bit about the unambiguous context in which some philosophical liberals, many, uh, have seen religious groups in public mainly it is a divisive problem for democratic states since these groups feature controversial conceptions of the common good. Who's common good? The institutional strategies for realizing them and conflicting ethics for evaluating them, which are all irresolvable in a morally pluralistic society. Instead, they ask, why can't we? Why can't we reach rational agreement on thinner moral rules in the form of contractual and procedural principles of justice as fairness, first come, first serve, or let's have as many rights as we can um, consistent with our responsibilities uh, not to interfere with those rights of others. Particularly, if we can get thinner rules that can be justified without favoring any one of the thick conceptions of good that divide Americans, why not do it? Such justification itself turns out to presuppose a particular conception of the person as prior to rather than constituted by her moral commitments. So answer critics of such procedural ethics and a kind of procedural republic ideal. They hold instead that one's participation in politics and law is and must be based on one's most basic convictions about human good. 
These convictions are essential to constitute persons and ground political deliberation and choice. They're defined and learned in terms of the multiple moral traditions within our culture. They're learned through our practical experience within the multiple spheres of social life to which these traditions ring true, in the family, schooling, and religious communities, for example, as well as politics and law. What holds us together as a polity and a people is not some comprehensive cultural agreement conceived as a value consensus of any sort of, quote, absolute values, thin or thick, or as a value-free arrangement of rules and rights to coordinate our disparate interests and ideals across seamless subcultural communities. Rather, we're held together by the coherence of our moral disagreement, an argument within an ongoing cultural conversation that embraces multiple moral traditions, multiple moral languages and practices in the actual lived out interplay of their social settings. For example, as we ourselves seek to be productive workers, cost-effective market actors, but also sensitive lovers, constant, uh, constant spouses, um, lifestylish consumers, if we'll admit to it, um, concerned citizens, and certainly bright students, and maybe even wise scholars. Through this process come into being the semi-covenants, the conditional absolutes, the situationally shared and varied ought-tos, as the historian Martin Marty calls them, which critically contest and rework our social order across institutional spheres. The moral argument of public life does not go on among seamless subcultural communities, each organically fused together around, quote, shared values and myths it socializes into its members. That's a 20th century social science myth or fiction. It goes on within each one of us and among us all because all of us share a common culture woven of contrasting moral traditions which themselves embody continuities of conflict over how we ought to live together. And all of us lead lives that span the different social institutions and practices to which religions, uh, to which traditions, not just religious ones, ring true, more or less arguably true, including a polity that's at once a religiously repub resonant republic and a liberal constitutional democracy. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about civil religion and public theology. So, in addition to being a divisive problem in American society, which it sometimes is, and in some ways often is, in addition to that, religion's also been part of our historically mediating answer to moral and practical problems posed by our mixed identity as a civic republic in tension with a liberal constitutional state, not a pure type of either one. We're both. Historically, religion mediates this tension first by establishing a kind of superstructural locus of moral sovereignty above the sovereignty of the state and the people. Thus, the Declaration of Independence points to the laws of nature and of nature's God, which stand above human laws and enable us to judge them. A solemn public reference to a God who stands above the nation and whose ends are moral standards to judge its conduct becomes a permanent feature of American political life ever after, and not least in protecting the sovereignty of individual conscience. But these, quote, civil religious ideals are thinly institutionalized within American government without explicit legal support or uh, sanction in the Constitution or the liberal philosophical side of our cultural heritage. It follows, argues Robert Bella, that sustaining the ultimate order that frames the civic virtues and values of a republic takes the form of public theology, as Marty has called it, by contrast to civil religion. The civil millennialism of the revolutionary period was such a public theology, and we've never lacked one since. Or we've never lacked a number of such public theologies and public philosophies, too. The main thing I want to do is get away from a kind of unitary, where you have one sacred canopy or one sacred foundation. If only we can all get on top of it or get under it. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Not from the beginning. From the beginnings of the American nation, the diversity and range of our public theologies are significant morally as well as analytically. Since, as Bella reflects, most of what's good and most of what's bad in our history is rooted in our public theologies. Every movement to make America more fully realize its professed values has grown out of some form of public theology, from the abolitionists to the social gospel, the early socialist party to the civil rights movement. 
but so has every expansionist war. So has every form of oppression of racial minorities and immigrant groups. If we look over the past century, we can see varieties of public theology multiplying within uh, or along with, in particular, the cultural disestablishment of Anglo-Protestantism amid broader recognition of, for starters, Catholic and Jewish social teaching. The distinctive social witness of the African-American churches has emerged nationally in our time. Religious pluralism today has grown to include communities of Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and other faiths. Not least, academic communities have nurtured ecological, feminist, liberationist, and related theologies, and a whole bunch more public philosophies among more and more educated religious leaders, and not just among them, but among even the unchurched too, who are often alumni of the religious communities of their upbringing. Spreading higher education, especially since World War II, has enriched the complex relations of a whole range of public theologies with more varied forms of public philosophy in America. Not just uh, rehearsals of civic Republican or Lockean liberal democratic or other kinds of classic traditions, but our current debates over the public sphere, over multiculturalism, over the politics of recognition, all of these have sprung and are nurtured from this spread of higher education. In some ways, we're the real church, which is invisible because we live in a dissenting Protestant history or a set of institutions. We're the church that's invisible, that's just there, um, rather than this or that sect or voluntary group. It's a free country. You don't have to have a soul unless you really want one, but you better have an educated, um, technically skilled uh, self to go to work, to contribute, and to draw from uh, that common uh, uh, reservoir of fruit, let alone to participate as a citizen. I want to come back to these points toward the end. Let's look for a moment at, quote, the infrastructural role of religion in the American Republic. It likewise combines civil religion and public theology by this account. And indeed, recent research confirms that religious communities continue to provide a cradle for democratic citizenship and civic aptitude one that is of particular importance for Americans who are otherwise institutionally disadvantaged or excluded, especially from higher education. Higher education is becoming much and much more important to teach citizens how to be good citizens than ever in our past. Those most active in religious communities, notably church-going African Americans, yes, and middle and lower middle class white evangelicals, offer striking exceptions to the rule of class-bound declines in political participation mapped in American society by Sidney Verba and other political scientists since the 1970s, with the greater fall-offs found the further down the social ladder one goes, with the sole exception of labor unions now shrunk to less than one quarter of their share of the private sector U.S. workforce 50 years ago, religious institutions provide the single most democratic counterweight to the cumulative process that favors those with more education, more income, more occupational clout and connections when they take part in public life. Now, let me turn to key institutional changes in the relationship of public theologies and philosophies to, to political ideology. And this is a lot of where the action and difficulty is over the last generation when it comes to religion and politics. Since 1960, there has been an explosion of hundreds and hundreds of non-denominational religious organizations devoted to governmental and public affairs in the U.S. national scene. Tripled, quadrupled, maybe more. There's no really good count. This includes the Christian Coalition and Focus on the Family on one side, for example. It also includes the Interfaith Alliance on the other, backed by the National Council of Churches. The proliferation of these politically oriented parachurch groups has far outpaced the growth of denominational churches themselves. But its yield is dwarfed in turn by the concurrent mushrooming of thousands and thousands of non-religious national political associations, from Common Cause to the Heritage Foundation, from MoveOn.org to uh, Progress for America. They stand formally free of political parties, yet they often couple public interest advocacy, policy research, and civic education on social issues, all those good things, with political lobbying and ideological advertising. Functioning as para-party groups, increasingly important as party affiliation decreases, core affiliation and parties narrow when you have more political independence, 
functioning as power party groups, they become more involved in direct electoral mobilization and campaign advertising. Mark the rise of the 527 committees, for example, that raised a record 550 million in soft money donations to back the 2004 election camps, far, far more than either the Democratic or national uh, committees. And uh, now are uh, just launching their swift boats into the stream of the 2008 primaries. Okay. The Democrats got more of that money than the Republicans did in 2004, even though it seems the Republicans used that money a whole lot more effectively in 2004. Compared to major religious denominations, most parachurch organizations are engaged in public advocacy and political lobbying that are uh, so engaged possess notably narrower, more homogeneous social profiles by education, age, occupation, income, and by the partisan political affiliation and issue-specific opinions of their members. Typically older, yes, less educated, cultural, quote, conservatives fill the ranks of groups that fight abortion and same-sex marriage, that champion creationism, school prayer, and family values. Typically younger, more educated, cultural liberals belong to groups dedicated to nuclear disarmament, racial and gender equality, environmental protection, and economic justice. Armed with such evidence, some observers warn against the social class divisions and culture wars they see parachurch groups declaring. Surprisingly little hard evidence has actually emerged of more polarized or ideologized social opinions among Americans generally, or even among religious, quote, liberals and conservatives in particular, with the significant exception of attitudes on abortion and related issue differences between those who identify strongly with the Republican or Democratic Party. Reli religious institutions within them, however, major denominations and some congregations too, show caucus church signs of growing more politicized and sometimes polarized along the lines of identity politics. In media wars waged by direct mail and email campaigns, televised sound bites, and voter guide blitzes on election eve, religious lobbies turn public theology toward political ideology. They bypass the unifying demands of congregational worship and creedal teaching and cover dish suppers with people you've got to live with even if you disagree with them on a bunch of issues and uh, political party affiliation. They tend to bypass that. Uh, and to do it in strategic efforts to manage public opinion, mobilize partisan constituencies, and play interest group politics with public officials. One of the biggest differences in the last, say, decade or two is political campaigns and parties, in turn, growing much more adept at turning these parachurch and caucus church dynamics to their own electoral lands by using them to build voting blocks around hot-button wedge issues. Here, it's worth heeding sharper calls, and lawsuits of late to separate partisan voter guides from faithful moral guidance and to separate political wolves, if you can really identify them, from their religious robes and their tax exemptions. But it's also worth thinking how we might strengthen the institutional integrity of political parties themselves to enlarge their moral coherence, particularly in their narrowed platforms and principles against the media-managed candidacy of individual campaigns. For it's these campaigns that are most driven by a single-issue political arithmetic to court the faithful with few holds barred and most drawn by huge advertising costs to embrace powerfully organized interests with deep pockets. Likewise, we might support religious denominations themselves in seeking to better teach their own members within communities of character that can stand up to partisan appeals from parachurch recruiters in league with political campaign managers. At the same time, to balance the view that Americans now face a dangerous dichotomizing of that one idealized, hoped for civil religion into separate and competing moral galaxies, or an uncivil war of orthodox and progressive believers with worldviews that are worlds apart. To hedge against that, it's also worth weighing the notion that we are in the midst of a fertile, if painfully broadening, of public theology and philosophies too, of their contested ambit among a larger, more educated, and more urbanized middle class, into this nonetheless coherent argument over how we ought to live and order our lives together have come culturally conservative Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and religious others in sufficient numbers and with sufficient eloquence as well as clout 
to make their voices heard. If Americans are willing to keep listening to one another and trying to persuade one another by example and critical conciliar dialogue alike, then this broadening of public theology promises to deepen and enrich the moral argument of our public life as a whole. In a sense, it's already done so, particularly for those problems such as abortion, gender, and the family, peace, and the poor, and not least, the fate of the two-thirds world and our warming planet, which have no neat solutions within the one-dimensional moral universe of individual interests, rights, and entitlements crowned by the national interest. For the counterposed ideologies of free market capitalism and welfare state liberalism at the core of American party politics today are likewise mortgaged to individualist axioms. They leave citizens nearsighted or even blinded to their interdependence and unmoved by their need to share responsibility for the common weal, which public theologies, at their arguable best, and we need to argue with them, persist in proclaiming. Today, in some more diverse communities of faith have found their voices in a more democratized, multivocal argument of public life. It unfolds within a more nationally integrated, densely organized, and morally contested pop polity, populated by a larger, more educated, and religiously representative middle class. In the coherence of its conflicts, this cultural conversation also bears the singular imprint of state-centered changes in our polity what political scientists typically call state expansion. So I want to think for a moment about the kind of cultural and moral dimensions of that. In the name of justice and progress, the regulatory reach and administrative sway of American government have grown for most of a century on the strength of its moral aspiration to extend human rights and realize human potential among all its citizens as partakers in the good life of a middle class people of plenty. However bitter the betrayals of these ideals in political practice, particularly over the last generation. However stunning the state's failures to achieve these ends fully, its partial triumph since the New Deal has given us a middle-class majority of Americans torn between voting their conscience and their interests in the name of the public interest. So we can't forego the civic promise of religious efforts to enlarge public conscience and cast clear light on the common wheel. For those who work hard and play by the rules, still bring to the pews of their houses of worship the burden of both their moral confusions and their faithful convictions. As the members of this middle class majority now question their shifting social rewards and responsibilities amid diverging fortunes and diminished dreams in a world grown smaller and touched by terror, high stakes rest in the balance of their counterposed yet interwoven visions of a world worth living in and working for. As the majority of the richest and most powerful nation on earth, the outcome of their choices entwines the fate of peoples everywhere. Before I close, I want to look briefly at one public issue, yes, pressed by the mainline churches, economic inequality and hardship as a problematical challenge to share social goods that are not only material, but also institutional and moral. I'm going to compress some of this if I can and very quickly just note what you already know. For generation after World War II, most Americans, not all, but most, shared an expanding economic prosperity, social security, and public provision. Between 1947 and 73, the middle class doubles in real size and real household income, as income grows more quickly at the bottom than at the top of the society. Since then, income's grown more quickly at the top than at the bottom, and it's sagged in the middle. This has made our prosperity much less equally shared than it was a generation ago. While US GDP and total income in that time between 73 and 2000 have increased by two-thirds. It's left one in eight Americans below the poverty line, just as in the 1970s, but now more of them are women, children, and persons of color. By 2005, a record 43% of them had sunk below half that line. That's $7,800 for a family of three into what the Census Bureau calls extreme poverty. One of four Americans today earns less than the nearly eight $9 an hour needed to keep a family of four above the official poverty line. The 37 million Americans below it, there are another 60 million not too far above it. Without higher wages or a stronger social safety net, as mainline church leaders have been stressing, work alone can't ensure a decent standard of living for many families on the lower half of our income ladder in America today, and charity alone cannot make up the shortfall. Yes, 
We're the richest nation in history, and we're richer than any other nation on Earth, with a very slight nod to Norway and North Sea oil. And we have the most unequal distribution of income of any industrialized society, with outsized rates of infant mortality and undersized access to medical care. Children at the bottom one-fifth of American families are poorer than their counterparts in 15 other industrialized nations. And on and on those statistics go. Now, in 2001, government spending on social welfare made up a smaller percentage of the U.S. national economy than at any other time since the 1960s, noted mainline church peace and justice bleeding heart critics, with federal taxes at their lowest level since the 1950s. But, but, if we count public provision for all Americans, not just the poor, the U.S. actually commits about 24.5% of its GDP to social spending, indirect as well as direct. It's about $800 billion each year, comparable to Sweden at 27% and Britain at 26%. In the distribution of its benefits, though, U.S. social spending is skewed upward instead of downward. For example, the U.S. is remarkable among developed nations for its paucity of public housing, but its public provision for private housing in the form of mortgage interest deductions alone approaches $100 billion a year. Some say it's more than that. These are highly contested figures, but it's about three times HUD's annual budget, getting towards $100 billion according to Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation uh, data and secondary analysis of that data. Those are our houses. That's our money. Darn right. Most of these deductions, about 57%, go to the 8% of homeowners with expanded incomes of over $100,000 per year. $100,000 a year, that's 92nd percentile. That's most of this $100 billion a year. What's that mean? Is that just a play of interest? That's the way the world goes? No, I think. In short, it means we help the neediest. We do. But we give more help to those seen, apparently, as the most deserving in terms of what they earn, spend, and save. Now, my point is not who's right or wrong on this. My point is Americans remain deeply divided over how to think about the good of government and what to do about matters such as these, particularly when it comes to voting and paying taxes or wages, however united we stand on the power of prayer and the value of volunteer work. Yes, globalized chains of economic cause and effect constrain this story of deepening inequality and persistent poverty in the midst of poverty only a few enjoy, while many work to make the economy grow. But, but, it's nonetheless vital to grasp this story as a moral drama with profound civic implications for how we ask and answer questions of what's fair, who deserves what, and how responsible we the people are for making things right through the equalizing institutions of public investment and provision, schooling, and collective bargaining. As our society grows more segregated by income into different towns, modes of transportation, places of work and play, our social experience diverges further, not just our interests. Both bear on grasping the differing outcomes for those at the top and those below of public decisions about taxes, trade, immigration, social insurance to protect our health, welfare, and retirement. Our common reservoir of moral intuition and sensibility about the good of government and its public works shrinks and shallows. So does our reservoir of trust in common norms to deal with our real differences, our deep differences. This threatens American ideals and practices of shared citizenship. Democracy thrives only if it sees to the universal distribution of hope as well as rights, only if it gives to all of its citizens a representative voice as well as a fair slice of the economic pie. How can we best help our neighbors in need and poverty? Americans ask sincerely, and why, they also ask, do those who work hard and play by the rules fail to find the rewards they deserve in a land of freedom and opportunity for all? These are questions of love as well as justice, and they've grown sharper over the past generation across the broad middle class of citizens whose votes and interests make up most of the electorate in our body politic, and they've come closer to touch the prayers and trouble the consciences of the faithful who make up most of our bodies of worship. In response to these questions, let me suggest, we need to join our fellow citizens as members one of another within the body politic. We need to focus our arguments and center our conversations in public around the goods that human beings need to live well enough to become good, including full public participation and social membership as goods in themselves. Why so? Let me wind up now. 
talking about the polity as a kind of moral community. Why so? Because in a democratic society, the greatest good is participation itself. It's both a right and a responsibility. For example, the right to vote and the right to earn. These are also our shared responsibilities as a people to take part in Republican self-government and contribute to the common weal. Good schooling, work, and wages are themselves constitutive conditions of the public participation we prize as a moral good essential to our democracy. Think for a moment what it takes, for example, to learn and practice the genuinely dialectical back and forth discourse, the back talk a democratic republic calls for. Such moral conversation requires a circle of persons small enough and possessed of enough shared time and learning to permit an equal and alternative balance of participation in turning a topic round and round. So if it's to extend beyond small elites, thoughtful and decisive civic conversation in a mass society like ours requires sufficiently high economic productivity, bureaucratic efficiency, and broad distribution of the benefits. That's what we actually need on the ground in order to free the time and focus the attention of women and men of every race and economic class for shared reflection, learning, and cultural fluency exercised as equals, as colleagues, in fact. For these practical virtues, you can't get them just by talking about them. You have to practice them. Confer the public power to speak in a true commonwealth and the moral authority to be heeded, even when, especially when, our voice doesn't carry the day and we don't get our way. Now, if this sounds like little more than a truism, piously invoked at civic and educational rights, God forbid, such as these, think for a moment of all the monologues on dialogue you have sat through, or worse, delivered to scores of silent listeners. Think of all the courses you've attended or taught with dozens or hundreds of students, with 45 minutes of lecture and five minutes, well, if we have time, and I don't know, I'm running late, left for questions. Think how often these ratios obtain, even in the classrooms of elite colleges, where tuition and fees now reach well beyond $30,000. As public aid ebbs, and the median household income of the students whose parents can afford these costs climbs well above $100,000. Finally then, think of the demanding institutional changes needed to enable us to put into practice the ideals of democratic dialogue and participation we so fervently preach or routinely rehearse. Because shared public languages and arguments about how to live together are what unites as a people, not identical interests or absolute values, we need to develop a more educative and civic conception of community itself instead of that romanticized, sentimentalized, clapboard idea of it that now prevails. We need religious, educational, and communal institutions, not only political ones, that serve to clarify debate about our moral differences and confusions over how we should live together, instead of striving simply to celebrate our common convictions or broker our opposing interests. Conversely, we need to revive a more educative conception of politics itself, less bound by the utilities of an administrative state and less driven by the group interests of client citizens. Money and power will talk less loudly in our politics only when citizens are willing and able to take part more equally and speak up more clearly in public or moral argument to make it ring truer to the whole of our experience as a society. This means we also need to revive a more covenantal and catechetical teaching conception of religion, one rooted in the soul of shared worship, amen, and exemplary moral witness, yet dedicated to critical and conciliar public dialogue and opposed to theocratic lobbying. Even as we safeguard the institutional separation of church and state in America, we should recognize that the synagogue, church, and temple as schools for virtue, like good schools themselves, share with the polity of a good republic an institutional model for civic life that's more like a forum and collegial assembly, a collegium and concilium than it's like a marketplace or a bureaucracy or, for that matter, a bully pulpit. As the prayerful and discursive community of all God's creatures, Communions of worship offer the larger society no prospect of an orthodox paradise on earth or, even worse maybe, a sectarian voting block 
or even an ever cheerful congregational fellowship writ large. Like Republican self-government, in fact, they offer us the sometimes uplifting, sometimes tragically troubling, and often just downright uncomfortable practices of a moral community in which we cannot escape or exclude the strangers who are our true colleagues and biblical neighbors. Let us engage them in argument as well as love. That's it. Thank you so much, Professor Tipton. We have uh, some time for some question and answer, if the professor is willing. Great. Uh, and you can give the answers uh, if you don't have any questions. Don't be embarrassed. Uh, uh, comments or conclusions, posing of questions are more than welcome. Yes? Well, you can comment on the Jones decision in the Kitzmiller case in which he privileged metaphysical Materialism over all other metaphysical points of view. Let me ask you to give your conclusions on that one. I'm sure you know more about it than I do. What do you think? Excuse me. What do you think? What do I think? Yes. Oh, this is not the occasion for. Uh, all right. All right. All right. On a decision which had that kind of influence. Let me simply say, because I don't know the details. is how um, kind of free exercise of religion <coughs> is weighted equally or not so equally depending upon both the content of the good, the, uh, the nature of the ontology, the worldview, the ethic involved. Part of what I'm saying is, um, you know, the kind of first prima facie test uh, is not one that's primarily about, is this vision of the divine, of the cosmic, of the inherent good of the universe somehow better than that one? Um, and that there is institutional separation in the sense, not just that churches uh, and other religious communities are governed by their own members, uh, not by uh, the state or vice versa, that forms of faith, um, which may be, quote, philosophical, ontological, deistic, not particularly theistic, that they have equal standing inside. And, uh, and here, you know, one argument that's a kind of culture's war argument in which I've made clear uh, I have a lot of uh, care and reservation about accepting that. But one argument is, well, you know, those materialist liberals, they're the real church. They're the ones who are in charge of the courts and the uh, state and the organs of public education. And, uh, you know, they need to be more civil. They need to be more denominational. They need to have more respect for uh, uh, religious equality and free exercise across the board. Yes? Yeah? Well, based on what you just said, you sort of gave a, a, a definition of sorts. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Eugene, Oregon is like the most unchurched city in, in the most unchurched state in the Union. Yeah. Uh, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, <laughs> well, and and we can start to say, well, what is it that here people do? What do we practice? Well, what I'm going to say so is, is, in your, I'm curious how you define religion and theology and such things, because um, I, myself, Lutheran, and Martin Luther in his writings back when, he, he said that nobody is without a God and nobody is without a religion. That your, um, how, what your world view is and how you live your life is basically what defines your God and, and your religion. And yet, we have allowed the use of the word religion to basically create an us and them reality, which, I mean, it could be correct to, to in, in much of what you're saying, use the word church to define, to, as a definer. But when you use religion, I would I would personally say that everyone has a religion. Okay. And I would personally say that everyone has a God. But it may not be a, the biblical God, and it may not be a, a religion in a, in, a, in, a, in a defined sense of like the Roman Catholic Church, for instance. Okay. And I'm just curious. What you well, forgive me as an ethnographer and a kind of social scientist, however it is exact. Uh, can we see a show of hands on, yes, everyone has a religion? Yes? How many agree? All right, can we see a show of hands on how many, uh, does everyone have a God? Oh, a little 
little less, a little less. Now, I want to say something that's not an all-purpose handy-dandy or cosmic definition of these matters to straighten it all out, but it is partly a testament to however unique your gene is. And I'm sorry, I come from San Francisco, so uh, <laughs> Berkeley. So uh, I love it here. And there are a few other places that are what, equally enlightened or you know, open cultural free fire zones or however you want to characterize it. Uh, life here are full of mystical monists with love in their heart to embrace all instead of orthodox uh, sectarians. That whether one is a Buddhist, mystical monist, uh, agnostic, you know, 96% of Americans say they believe, quote, kind of in God, but let me tell you a little bit more. It doesn't always get onto the Gallup poll. God's the white light, is the inner light within all of us, is the this, the that. It's Buddha mind and uh, so on and so forth. Um, it's that moment when the sun hits the water and it all goes green and for just one moment you know that you and I and we are all one with the all, the ocean within us and without us and so on and so forth. You don't need to be mystic. You can read the travel section of a really good Sunday paper like the New York Times and see that all over the place in every advertisement. Tell me again, where is that beach? It's any beach at all. And it's that moment, and we have a sacramental beverage in our hand, and we are all in, in the moment that extends for all eternity, or at least two weeks until we have to go back. And that isn't just advertising, it's not just our imaginations. That's at least three or four hundred years of romantic ideals, poetry. Uh, it is also John Locke and Hume and a sense of self. You don't have to be a Buddhist, it's just moment by moment. There's a lot of cultural work that's gone in. And that's part of our heritage, too. But another part of our heritage, a la Luther, is we're the first in nation. We don't have a pope. We don't have a king. And we also don't have an established church. Thank goodness. Tocqueville says that's the greatest thing here. It's the greatest thing. That there's not anything to fight about when it comes to matters ultimate, moral, and spiritual that's really political. You're really fighting about the Catholic Church in uh, the palace bedroom with the king pushing the peasants around and holding the incipient bourgeois down. That we have a society in which every, quote, church, communion, synagogue, or whatever, stands outside the state, the palace, the government, and is a voluntary association. You may be born into this or that, but you can move. And if you're a true Protestant, you have an internal faith conversion when you're old enough to have it. You may have been baptized when you were an infant, um, but to uh, be really a member, you have to undergo that conversion. You have to make that sovereign, conscientious choice or not. Whether you're Buddhist, mystic, or none of the above, we have a set of institutions that are profoundly rooted in that dissenting idea, in that voluntary establishment, not uh, a political establishment or religious communities and so on. So actually, some of what divides us is what unites us. Those can which include Luther, God bless him, including the idea that each of us is called in our own mind um, to follow our call. Uh, however, <coughs> mysticized or uh, you know, uh, removed from this or that canon, um, that that's our true calling. And it's part of our calling to be good citizens, too. It is moral depth and profundity. Nobody else is going to do it for us. Just like nobody else is going to, quote, make up the church or the synagogue if we're not there. You're an Orthodox Marianite uh, Christian. You don't need the people there. They're always there already. You got the priest and an acolyte. That's enough. And God's there, sir. No, we got to be there. You know, whether it's here or there. Whether it's saints marching out, especially over the last generation, too, when they get a little bit more education, intermarry. Half of all mainline Protestants are intermarry. Uh, and, what, three, one out of every three Jewish households in the United States, say, as somebody who's not born Jewish. So intermarriage, denominational switching, increased education, that's part of our story, too. What we really believe in or committed to, even if it doesn't have a denominational designation. Or is it, you know, materialist? <coughs> no. There are not many real fervent materialists, just like there aren't many real fervent atheists. Kind of more people, no, I'm not so worried about that. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, so speaking to your last point, that the wealth disparities that are increasingly at least from a statistical sense, do you find them reflected in any political uh, divisions in this otherwise, uh, prior to this time, fairly monolithic, at least in, in terms of stereotype, monolithic, uh, non-denominational group that
that seems actually to be most threatened by it in terms of its material circumstances. Does any polling data suggest to you that, that this is beginning to be reflected in any systems or subgroups? Uh, well, let me, let me try the same move, uh, Mr. President, and that is, uh, <laughs> what do you think, uh, <laughs> Mr. Relevant, but uh, your intuitions, the social intuitions, and the uh, moral ones too, if you want to have it, about these matters. I mean, I, I uh, as I indicated, I'm struck partly by, if you want to call it the, the ironic triumph of the New Deal, which becomes bipartisan and includes all kinds of domestic policy social liberals like Richard Nixon, uh, <laughs> as well as LBJ and the Great Society, um, which is to create uh, a kind of people, uh, not just a plenty, but who can share and share through their equality in uh, forms of citizenship and uh, joint responsibility for the whole. And that that's made a world of difference in expanding a middle class, which is now ditched for a whole bunch of complex reasons. And uh, you can supply your own. And a lot of it, an immensely technical story that's right here on the ground. It's the timber industry in uh, Oregon and all sorts of other things. It's a story partly of moral disappointment that is burdening and is shared by the broad American middle class, and that people are actually standing up to it and doing very, very well, even though there are real anger and resentment and real moral disappointment. Not just about, I'm not getting what's due to me, but uh, disappointment about the country. And there's polling evidence that if you open the question out, 89% I mean, of Americans say, we're, we're going in the wrong way, we're on the wrong path, and not just post 9-11 and the Iraq war, uh, let alone, in polling data, some of the best of it, I'd say in the 2004 election, oh, values voters, that was the most salient issue for 22%. Yes, because they didn't parse uh, abortion and same-sex marriage and a little bit stem cell research. Uh, in fact, 38% of Americans were concerned about jobs, education, income, health care. Uh, and many of them in this burdened and worried and anxious middle, um, they're not right power, they're not high tech, they're not trust fund babies way up at the top. They're in the middle and they're trying to do the best for they, they can for the country. And concerns about taxes, public provision, and deserve. Who deserves what? Not least schooling is so important, not just because it's an angle or an advantage, but because school is fairer than life. It's not just that you can move on and get up. You can get far enough up now. It's one of the stories that you have to get higher up in the educational ladder to be more economically and occupationally uh, secure. Um, but because school is fairer than life, and there's a respect based on merit and effort and try hard. A uh, great book, Alicina and Glaser, it's got a lot of comparative data in the United States and Western Europe. Seventy percent of Americans believe, are deeply convinced, if you're having trouble, if you're doing not so well or poor, look first to yourself. Don't blame God and certainly don't blame, quote, the system. Seventy percent. Seventy percent in Europe believe uh, it's luck or stuff. Depends where you were born, started out. Uh, what the breaks were. Um, so that's partly who we are, and it seems to be much more tied to, quote, cultural values than it is to class interests. Um, yeah? Thomas Jefferson said uh, that each generation should raise voting rights to each generation of Americans. We're about five constitutions behind. I'm wondering what changes you would make to the American Constitution to make it better. Well, what are your suggestions? <laughs> Congregationalist 
heard maybe six to 8,000 hours worth of sermons. Uh, today, the estimates for a middle class, conventionally plugged in uh, young American, privileged enough to go off to a fine uh, institution like this and turn off the TV, has uh, taken in 15 to 18,000 hours of television programming. That may be great if the tubes always turn to PBS. But in fact, Annenberg Communication Studies uh, show, for example, uh, not just, but particularly in prime time, there are only a few genres of plots. Yes, they get hybridized, uh, cowboy, detective, vampire, space cadets. Um, but for the most part, stories about earning your own way, winning love as well as success, um, standing against corruption, you know, cowboys, uh, CSI detectives, and so on. Um, that's absolutely uh, inherent, deep in our brain in our revivalist grain, even our Calvinist grain, it's a corrupt society out there. You've got to be a hero to resist it. And, and have a good time, too, you know, when you're out on the streets. And, uh, and part of the corruption, like Hawthorne, is not just at the bottom, it's corrupt all the way up. The mayor, the governor, oh my god, the National Security Council, that you know who, or uh, <laughs> don't you, uh, you know, in the White House, or uh, in uh, the office next door. Those kinds of those, too, are about our visions. Back to Jefferson. Yes, and Jefferson's a classical, uh, it's a way, small arm Republican, Machiavelli, and all those uh, folks in that tradition who say, you know, corruption is part of the nature of republics. They're fragile. The Alicina and Glazer book about uh, luck or stuck, 70% of Europeans, 30% or less of Americans, they say, well, we're remarkable because of the history of our political institutions. We had an 18th century revolution, and we skipped the 19th century one. Jefferson was right in principle, but Hamilton was right in fact. We got a big, complex uh, society that's got a lot of not just power uh, exerted elsewhere, but discipline upon us, ourselves. And it's schooling and occupational and the increasing demands on shaping uh, and sustaining and paying for a middle class life are part of that story. So yes, it's a constitutional matter, but it's also a matter of how we actually live our lives from day to day and how we can be responsible for taking care of our own business as actors who do get to the bottom line, who are responsible for cost-benefit calculation and reading at a fourth grade level and so on, right on through uh, to time uh, retirement. Uh, we're a massively age-graded society that is tied to just how much merit and comparative judgment there is in our everyday lives. Um, reading at fourth grade level or G1 to 23 to retirement, all of that stuff in some ways is comparative, uh, evaluative, and the like. It may not be uh, who's holier than thou, but who is more competent, who has got the skill set, who has uh, got the motivations, and so on. These are all moral matters in a way. And uh, as citizens, um, we need to think about being responsible together uh, for how we work them out, how we judge them together, and not uh, least in our disagreements over them, which are there as they should be. So uh, what's the data look like? Um, the data looks like there are a lot of folks in the middle saying, you know, we're going down the wrong path, and it's not just because uh, the uh, Chinese uh, have all the jobs unless you have a fancy education, that there are other things that we need to work on. Yes? I don't speak English, so I can't answer this question. Uh, I'll ask you, in this diverse society we have, um, what can we do to get a mirror up to see who we really are? Our values are very different. Certainly the rest of the world see us for not just now, many, many years of being a pretty illegal country. It's always like our armies, we like to march around the world. And we also have a um, great deal of trouble. I, I remember I'm outside the country, people are absolutely flabbergasted that we have, have a, a party or a, do something to raise money to take a child. How do we bring, how do we get an, an honest mirror up to ourselves in this kind of diverse religious and value society? What do you think? I don't speak English very well. Oh, you sound to me like you're doing well. Huh? What do you think? Well, I mean, one thing uh, that we're already doing, but we can do better, as I suggested, is uh, in a way, listen and recognize one another, especially where it seems we don't agree, and then see why and how that is. 
but actually there's a lot of agreement among Americans in, in terms of polling evidence. Uh, there's almost nobody who says, uh uh, when you ask them, do you want to end war, uh, racial discrimination, poverty, whatever? I mean, right across the board. Right across the board. Whether they're, quote, religious or political, liberal or conservative. There's lots of agreement. When you ask about specifics, what's that mean? Or we should do this or that, then yes, there are differences. Some of those differences look pretty transparent and predictable in terms of, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm worth 100 million bucks and I really work hard for it. And uh, I'm investing, I have money at risk uh, in creating jobs and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, I mean, some of the kind of vision of markets are more efficient for doing all sorts of things, not just uh, mundane market transactions, allocating resources and so on. There's part of it that's transparent, but there's also part of it that's more like ideal interests or convictions. Um, and there, one of the ironies, maybe in terms of our relationship to the world, twofold. One fold of it is we are distinctive in key ways. If you count Scotland, it's a country, not a national society. They and we are the sort of two dissenting Protestant nations with a peculiar set of institutions um, that are about church and state, but also about individual responsibility. And one of the things that we talk and think in terms of individual responsibility that goes along with individual rights rather than a whole set of kind of corporate goods and uh, uh, handouts or whatever. And there are arguments about, look at the differences, say, in abortion and divorce law between the US and Western Europe, a lot of it. We look different, not better, but you know, we carry out a lot of our concerns in terms of individual rights and individual responsibilities rather than corporate provision, whether it's for children or maternity leaves or whatever. I mean, in terms of moral logics, and there's some stuff on this, Americans are big-hearted and good-hearted. When we see need, people shouldn't starve, uh, go hungry in the streets. We're all responsible for responding on the one end. On the other end, a lot of emphasis on earning, on putting in to draw out. And in the middle, a kind of thinning or expanding uh, vision of rights that sort of depends on what are the rights about. Um, where clear-cut, quote, negative legal civil rights, uh, a right to vote, right to a uh, fair trial, jury, of course, of course. Social rights, right to a job, wait a second, uh, a really good job? Uh, one of the most interesting things that shows movement is medical care, where there is a movement, particularly over the last generation, over the last 50 years, you can see it uh, um, developing, where Basic health care, adequate health care. There is a hedge there, but health care is increasingly seen by Americans now, about three out of four, as, quote, a right that is inherent in being a citizen, not one that is limited to those with better educations and occupations and an employer finance uh, pension, uh, health plan. So there's movement, but we are distinctive in ways, and now part of the irony is that in some ways, universal rights, human rights, including the right to self-determination of all people's Part of our problems in the world are that all sorts of folks believe that now. That that is part of our gospel, an enlightenment gospel in part, a Eurocentric gospel, but also tied to Roman and uh, uh, natural law and uh, so on. And a lot of the world actually believes it, even though to exercise that right to self-determination might wind up with a society and a kind of government that looks quite different from the world. That's just the beginning. But yeah, it's hard uh, anyone in the deepest moral as well as the kind of social sense to quote, see ourselves as we really are, but to partly appreciate that through our differences and the contradictions that we share, as well as some real convictions. For example, not luck or stuff, you know, it's lazy. You know, a lot of people are lazy and they need to get up and go and work harder and uh, uh, make God their business partner or at least understand the calling that God gives to all of us as members of a priesthood of believers or a sangha of uh, all big dharma minds or what have you, uh, rather than to say, hey, that's somewhere else, somebody else do that. So we have internal uh, contradictions that by recognizing one another, we can get out a little bit. As well as, yeah, we do share a lot. Uh, yeah. Church 
Well, uh, I think it, quote, depends on the case. I mean, one of the things that spending time in uh, Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill uh, uh, with denominational church offices uh, opened my eyes to, and at times really surprised me about, is uh, uh, look on, quote, key issues or, or big things. Um, the, these folks are in a room, say, on handbill control with 300 other people of whom maybe a dozen are from the denomination. And they're not just parachurch, but there are these freestanding issue advocates, or environmentalist stuff, even more so. Environmentalism, in some ways, is a very good uh, issue, not least now, because it shows the enormous difference that NGOs have made, as well as now increasingly the UN and the like. And also the way that um, in, and not just now, evangelicals too, uh, but the ways in which um, schooling, as well as political action, as well as religious insight, preaching, but practice too. Uh, the head of the National Council of Churches, when I was working on this book a few years back, John Brown Campbell, said, if only all my other issues were like environmentalism. We can teach it here, they're getting it in good schools, and you know what else? We can have them recycle. It's like saying their prayers every day. They get to kind of do a religion-like practice that makes a difference. It's not whether you please or feel like it or not, that we actually live in a naturally lawful universe. You don't need to believe in God uh, to figure that one out. And we can't just do whatever we want, um, uh, it, it seems, without some real harmful consequences for all of us. So uh, that's the, the good. And uh, you know, I wish all my other issues were like that. You know, poverty, inequality, peace, anti-imperialism. People, go, oh, more left-wing cannons rolling about the God Squad at Washington D.C. You know, give us our money back. We want to pitch the church roof and feed some hungry people out the back door in the blue pantry. You know, uh, so uh, the, the answer is yes. It's made a lot of difference, and it depends what the issue is, and also depends where you're seeing it. So some of the folks in the middle, as well as to the right, uh, when the National Council, the mainline churches, were out there marching and demonstrating uh, in 2002 and three, uh, thought, well, if it were just the church folks, that's okay. Um, uh, and in fact, no one from a major denomination, with the possible exception of Richard Land, who was uh, at the Southern Baptist Convention and was not the head of it, he's the head of a big commission, came out and said, this is a just war, it's a good crusade, let's go for it. Um, uh, uh, but uh, nonetheless, when some folks in the middle said, gee, well, they're the church folks out there with MoveOn.org and this or that other, you know, explicitly political group, not so religious group, that may not be a plus from that point of view. So it's, it's complex. There's a lot of complex interaction. And, uh, uh, and that's partly characteristic of the nature of our politics, particularly since the once upon a time, and I mean Catholic Republicans as well as New Deal Democrats. 